Today we want to finish this topic on data transmission. So we can move on to transmission media. Yesterday we finished talking about, or we ended by talking about noise and the impact of noise on signals. So let's recap on that and uh, try and cover, make sure everyone understands how noise has an impact on our the number of errors that we may have for different signals and for different uh, different shape signals and different data rate signals. We had two two examples of a signal yesterday, which one was a sine wave. which effectively, if we look at our general equation that we've used in our examples, has one sine component. In some of the equations, we had sine plus one third sine plus one fifth sine. Well, a sine wave like this is just one sine component. And the next one on the screen was a square wave, which in theory, to get a perfect square wave, we keep adding sine components in that pattern. If we have an infinite number of components, So if we wrote an equation for this signal, S A of T equals some magnitude sine 2 pi F T, where F is 1,000. Whereas the, so that's the current signal, whereas the second one is sine 2 pi 1000, the, the frequency of the signal is 1000 hertz, 1000 T, plus, if we follow this pattern, sine 2 pi times 3 times 1000 T, plus another component, 2 pi 5 times 1000 T, and keep going forever, If you keep going forever and add them up, you'll get a perfect square wave. Similar to this, this is not a perfect square wave, but close. Which signal occupies the most bandwidth? The sine wave or the square wave? The bandwidth. Which signal occupies the most bandwidth? The square wave. Remember, we look at bandwidth. In fact, it's, it's a, well, almost a trick question because this is just a single impulse. But uh, if we see here, we have one frequency component at 1,000 hertz, one at 3,000, and somewhere down the end, one at inf infinity. So, in fact, it has an infinite bandwidth, that signal, in theory. The more components we add with the same frequency, the larger the bandwidth we occupy. Which signal is more accurate, or which signal will result in less errors due to noise? Sine wave or square wave? Which one is more accurate? The square wave is more accurate, and that's what we tried to explain with these diagrams yesterday, that to get an error with a given amount of noise, if we just have two levels, high level, low level, an error occurs if the received signal has a value which is closer to the other level. Transmit a low level here, minus one, or it's low. If we receive and the receiver thinks it's the high level, that's been received, and that's obviously an error because what's transmitted and what's received is wrong or is different. So that's the error occurs if the noise is large enough to change the transmitted signal at one level such that the received signal is at the different level. So it depends upon the magnitude of the noise and the shape of the signal. 
because in the sine wave we need to change, if we look at the average, we need to move all of this, which is currently negative, to be positive. With a square wave there's more signal to move to make it an error. So the more components, the larger the bandwidth, which is bad. The more components, the more accurate the signal is, which is good, the less errors. So there's the trade-off in selecting different signals here. And then we finish with another example. Up until now, we've always said that we've got this scheme. High level represents one bit, low level another bit. Let's write that down. When I talk about a level, I mean, all right, here's one level. Plus one is one level, minus one is another level. The exact value is not important. We call it, let's say, some level one, for example, plus one, whatever the units are, maybe transmitting plus one volts. And the other level, level two, minus one as an example. And we used a level to represent a bit or a piece of information. The mapping from a level to bits is up to the designer. The obvious one we think about is that high level, bit one, low level, bit zero. But in fact, in practice, that's not, it's usually the opposite that's used. In this example, we used low level of the signal to represent a bit one and a high level bit zero. We had a scheme like this in this example. The designer needs to de specify what this scheme is. Which means if I want to transmit a bit one, I'll transmit a signal at a level two, for example at minus one volts. That's what we've assumed so far in all our analysis and we did some analysis and from these signals we can find the bit rate or the data rate. But we don't have to have this scheme and that's what these two different signals show. That's the top scheme, map one level to one bit. We can do something different. Here we have four different levels. And in this specific example, we can say that it's a plus 1, plus 0 0.33, minus 0 0.33, and minus 1. With four levels, if we want to be able to represent any sequence of bits, then we can at best map each level to two bits. Let's say I want to transmit this random sequence of bits. Well, there's eight bits, that'll do. With the first scheme, what I'll transmit, if I write down the level, okay, I've got one bit to send, send at level one, uh, sorry, bit one, level two, bit zero, level one, bit one, two, two, one, 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 to. This is the level that we would transmit our signal at. This is the data that we want to send using the first scheme. Alternately, we can use the second scheme. If we define a mapping like this, level 1, 0, 0, level 2, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, then to transmit this sequence of bits, what we can do, I'll write it again, Look at the first two bits, one zero. One zero, transmit level signal at level three. Second do two bits, one one, transmit signal at level four. Zero zero, level one, zero one, level two. So we're not limited to just using two levels. In theory we can have as many levels as we like. Here we compare the difference and see how it impacts upon the number of errors in the data rate. So if we want 
to be able to transmit two bits per level, we would need four different levels because we have four combinations of two bits. If we wanted to transmit three bits per level, we'd need eight different levels. We'll see in a later topic that the levels we sometimes refer to as, and we may see in fact today, a signal element. That is, remember this is our signal, this entire signal, this is one element of the signal. This is another element of the signal. The different signal elements. We'll come back to that later. So the thing we care about, well, which of these two is better? Well, the two things that have an impact here, the data rate and the number of errors. First, the data rate is easier. If we calculate, if we look at the diagrams, yesterday I mentioned the period. Ignore the period. Just look at the diagrams because they have the time scale on them. In the top one, how many bits per second can we send? Just from the diagram. How many bits per second? Here's the scale in seconds up here. 2,000 bits per second. If we look here, this is zero. This is 0 0.001, which is one millisecond, so this must be half of a millisecond. That is one bit or one level, one signal element, in half a millisecond. Each signal element represents a single bit. So in fact, this represents just one bit. One bit in half a millisecond is two bits in one millisecond, which is 2,000 bits in one second. So with a top scheme, we can get a data rate of 2,000 bits per second. Now the bottom scheme. What's our data rate? Four thousand. We can do the same. Again, half a millisecond, one signal element, but now our signal element represents two bits. So we've got two bits in half a millisecond, which is four bits in one millisecond, which is four thousand bits in one second. Using this different signaling scheme, we can double the data rate. So that's good about the bottom one. The other part is how are these signals impacted by noise? If we introduce the same amount of noise into them, how many errors are going to occur? Which one is going to have more errors? Well, focusing back on the top signal, we know an error occurs when the transmitted level changes to the opposite level from the receiver's perspective. That is, if we transmit at plus one and what is received is if we receive a value at 0 0.1, the receiver will assume that that is still level one. Because the receiver looks, we can think, as which level is closest to the received signal? We've got plus one or minus one. If what's received is 0 0.1, the closest is still plus one. And therefore, if plus one was transmitted and 0.1 was received, then we'd assume it's a zero, bit zero at the receiver, which is correct. So assuming we transmit level one, if we receive a signal at level 0 0.5, what's closer, plus 1 or minus 1? What's closer? 0 0.5, which value is closer? 1 plus 1. Plus 1 is closer. So the closest one, therefore we assume it's this level, which is 0. 0 was transmitted, 0 received, fine. Receive a signal at level minus 0 0.1. What is closer, plus 1 or minus 1? Minus one is closer now. So what the receiver does is looks at the received signal, compares it to the possible transmitted signals, which are either plus one or minus one. Whichever one is closer, it can assume is the correct one. Receive minus 0 0.1 is the signal level. Closest to level two here, minus one. Therefore, assume that the received bit is one. There's a bit error. If we transmit at plus one volts, or the level, 
level one, meaning we're sending a bit zero, but we receive at minus 0 0.1. What the receiver does is sees, okay, the closest is this, therefore it must have been a bit one sent. That's a mistake. That's a bit error. Transmit zero, receive one. And similar, receive minus 0 0.5, then closest is still level two, and that would be a bit error. How much do we need to shift to get a bit error in this case? A shift of more than one in this case, because if you transmit a plus one and you bring it to negative, less than zero, it will be a bit error. There's a difference of one. And similarly, if you transmit it at minus one and the noise introduced a change or a shift of plus one, it will bring it to above zero. And the receiver would again detect it. Oh, the receiver would make a mistake in what bit they think was sent in that case. So the shift or the magnitude of the noise, that's what causes the shift, the noise. The magnitude of the noise that will cause an error with this scheme is, I'll write it up here, if it's greater than one. If the noise is greater than one, then we'll get a bit error with this scheme. Now let's look at our second scheme, what happens. Let's assume, just as a one case, uh, let's assume we transmit level two, okay, which is the first case here. We transmit this at a level two, which is plus 0 0.33, representing the bits 0, 1, then if the receiver receives a signal with a level of 0 0.4, Four, which of the four levels is closest? So compare point 0.4 to these, which one is closest? You'll see that this is the closest. Point 0.33 to point 0.4. This is the closest, therefore the receiver assumes the bits were zero, 0.1. Transmit zero, 0.1, receive zero, 0.1, that's good. What if we receive something different? 0.5. Which one's closest? I think it's still this value is closest. 0.33. It's the difference of what? 0.17, whereas to level 1 it's still 0.5 is the difference. So the closest is still level 2, so 0, 01 received, good. 0.7. Which one is closest? Compare 0.7 to 0.33, it's a difference of 0.37. Compare it to plus 1, it's a difference of 0 0.3. Now, level 1 is closer. So if the receiver receives a signal value, a magnitude of 0 0.7, it compares to the four possible transmitted values. Whichever one is closer, it assumes was the transmitted signal, and therefore assumes the received bits would be 0, 0. We have a bit error. Transmit 0, 01, receive 0, 0. Something's gone wrong. How much did we have to shift? How much noise was needed to cause a bit error in this case? Well, for level 2 being transmitted, how much noise is needed, or what does the noise need to be greater than to cause a bit error? 0 0.33. It's the midpoint of these two. What's halfway between 1 and 0 0.33? You'll find it 0 0.66. That is, if what is received is greater than 0 0.66, the receiver will assume it was level 1, because it's closer to this one. If the noise is greater than 0 0.33 in this case, we'll get a bit error. In the first case, if it's greater than 1, we'll get a bit error. The point here is that with the two different signals, with the same amount of noise, it's more likely to get bit errors with the second signal compared to the first signals. Remember, noise is not fixed. Noise, no, normally, noise is random. It goes up and down. So it, we talk really about the probability of bit errors. 
here we're simplifying just to look at absolute values of the of the noise level. With the first scheme, we need a large amount of noise to get a bit error. With the second scheme, we need a smaller amount of noise to get a bit error. Therefore, the second scheme is more susceptible to noise. Yep. What if the receiver received uh, 0 0.66? Uh, what if it receives 0 0.66? Okay, we need a cutoff somewhere. We need to make a practical decision, okay, it needs to be greater than or equal to 0.66 to map to 0.1, uh, plus 1, or less than 0.66 to map to the second level. So there must be some rules defined at the receiver. You, you can receive a signal between minus 1 and plus 1, and you say anything greater than 0.66, I'll map to level 1, so greater than Anything equal to or less than 0.66, but greater than zero, I'll map to level two, and so on for the others. Okay, so that's defined at the receiver. So if you get exactly on some place, you need to make a decision. Do you treat it as above or, or below? The numbers are not so important in this example. The, whether the 0.33 and all those are just to illustrate this case. The point is to recognize the more levels we have in our signal, the more chance we can get an error. And if you look closer, that's the, the two signals with the error added into it, or the noise added into it. You, if you look closer to the second one, there's a, I think there's a couple of cases where the, the noise causes an error at the receiver. That is, it thinks the wrong level was received. Any questions on this? Is it important to, get, to understand the concept here? Not, just the, not really the numbers, just the concept. We have time for questions. We're a little bit ahead of the IT section, so we have a bit more time today. We can go a bit slower. Uh, what, what's this? This is uh, the signal equations for, on the board, we wrote an equation for the first sine wave, just one component, and then equation for the square wave, which is in fact an infinite number of sine components. That's, I think, in some of the earlier lectures. Not important for this. The more components, the point in this part, the more components, the larger the bandwidth. There. OK. Discussion, that's good. What do you find? Okay, the question is what, what, if, what if the transmit signal is plus 1 and the receive signal is 1.5? Well, we need, in practice, there'll be some limits. Uh, in this example, everything's normalized to between minus 1 and plus 1. Okay, it's just normalized. So if it was in fact the receive signal was between minus 2 and plus 5, we could normalize it back to plus 1, minus 1. Uh, but we have some practical limits. Uh, in this case, it's just plus 1 and minus 1 for simplicity. It could be at different, different levels. But we just, importantly, we needed to divide, divide the space, minus 1 to plus 1, between the four different levels in this case. And if it falls within one range, it corresponds to level one, another range, level two, and so on. Uh, it's not the noise is greater than, the, in here what I mean, if the noise, in this case, if the noise is greater than one, in the first case, 
we will get a bit error. Because if I transmit a plus one and the noise is, and this means the absolute magnitude of the noise, if the noise is minus 1.5, it'll bring us down below our cutoff. In the first case, if I transmit a pos plus one and what's received is negative, then that will result in an error. Because if I transmit a plus one and receive minus 0 0.3, the receiver thinks this one's closer, therefore this one must have been transmitted. But in fact, 0 was transmitted, but the receiver thinks a 1 was transmitted. That's an error. So in the first case, if the noise is greater than plus 1, there'll be an error in that the received signal will be closer to the opposite level, the wrong level. In the second case, if we just look at transmitting level 2, if the noise is greater than 0.33, we can get an error. Comparing these two, we can say, with a fixed amount of noise, if the noise on average was 0 0.5, if the noise on average was 0 0.5, in the first case, no errors because it needs to be greater than 1. But in the second case, errors. So with the same amount of noise, more chance of errors in this case. More chance to get the wrong level with the receiver. That's if the noise is greater than that, that value. Not 0.67. Why is it not 0 0.67? You now you're getting very fine tuned. Why not 0 0.666666 continuous? Okay, that's the real value. Uh, it depends where you round it up. Okay. If you implement it, then you need to have some cutoff somewhere. Okay. If it's greater than 0 0.66 or greater than or less than, you, you need to implement that uh, cutoff somewhere. Any other questions before we move on? Summarize our points now that we know about signals. Uh, higher, higher bandwidth gives us a higher data rate. So if we increase the bandwidth, and we, this was from yesterday and even last week, if we increase the bandwidth of our signal, we can get a higher data rate. But a higher bandwidth leads to more cost, so the good thing about increasing bandwidth is high data rate, the bad thing is the high cost, so there's a trade-off. Different signals will give us different bandwidths and different uh, impact of noise. That is, when we compare the sine wave to the square wave, by increasing the bandwidth, going from the sine up to the square wave, if we increase the bandwidth, we are less susceptible to noise. That is, the square wave, less likely for noise to happen. Uh, sorry, less likely for errors to happen. If we have the same amount of noise, with some signals, the square wave, we have less chance of errors compared to using the sine wave. So some signals are more susceptible to noise than others. That is, some signals, more errors will occur than others. And in general, the larger the bandwidth, the less chance of errors. And what we've just seen, we can also use more levels in the signal that we transmit. And the more levels we use, the higher the data rate. So that's where the bottom one is good. We can send faster, 4,000 bits per second compared to 2,000 bits per second. But the more levels we use, the larger chance of error because we only need a small amount of noise to cause some error. More levels used, higher bandwidth, a higher data rate, that's good, but more errors, that's bad. So we've got different trade-offs to consider when someone designs the signal to be transmitted.
what we're going to finish on with this topic is some, some theory has been developed to try and relate these factors together. That is, we care mainly about data rate, how fast we can send, how many bits per second. But we know bandwidth impacts on data rate, or has a relationship with data rate, and we now also knows, know that noise impacts on uh, our performance. Well, people have done some analysis and look at the theory and see the relationship between these different factors. So we're going to talk. We're going to cover two of the more com or the most common uh, theorems or equations that relate data rate to bandwidth. They're called, or we talk about channel capacity. By channel, I, we mean just the transmission medium, the channel, the link, where we send our data, uh, send our signal. And the capacity is the maximum that we can send through that channel. And we care about data rate. So we're talking really about what's the maximum data rate we can send across a link. Or in other words, what's the channel capacity? Maximum data rate at which data can be transmitted across a given communication channel or link. What we'd like to relate and find out if we have, if we know the bandwidth of some channel, if we know how many, what range of frequencies we can send across the channel, what data rate can we achieve? The bandwidth depends upon the transmitted signal and the transmission media. Depends whether you're using a copper wire, uh, radio uh, transmission across the air and so on. So different signals or different channels can carry different bandwidth signals. We want to relate the two together. Similar, we know that noise has an impact on performance. We spoke about noise here. And related to noise really is error rate. So we're going to go through two theoretical models that relate these factors together. And they've been developed by different people. Nyquist done some of the original work, a guy called Nyquist. Another guy, Hartley, expanded upon that. And Shannon also improved these things. We'll see their names come up later as well. And we're going to refer to two theorems as the Nyquist capacity or the Nyquist equation and the Shannon capacity, Shannon equation. Focusing first on Nyquist. Nyquist did some analysis. And we're not going to go through and prove this or make any attempt to uh, go through how it's derived. But Nyquist did some analysis under the assumption that our communications channel has no noise. Okay? To make things simple, he says, OK, there's no noise in the system, which is never true. There's always noise. But to make the analysis easier, it's, he assumed that there's no noise. If there was no noise in the communications channel, he came up and said that given a bandwidth of B, if we transmit a signal with bandwidth of B, then the highest signal rate is 2 times b. Signal rate is the rate at which we can send our signal elements. This is one signal rate, a signal element. The signal rate is how often we can send these signal elements. We differentiate between signal rate and data rate because a signal element can represent more than one bit. In this case, one signal element represents one bit. In the second case, a signal element represents two bits. Both of these have the same signal rate. What is it? We can say both of those signals have a signal rate of 2,000 signal elements per second. That is. There's one element in half a millisecond. In one millisecond, there's two elements. In 10 milliseconds, if you count them, there's 20 elements. In one second, there's 2,000 elements. Let's say 2,000 signal elements per second. That's the same with both of those signals, if you count them, where this is one signal element, and the same here. 
But the data rate differs because in the top one, one signal element represents one bit. So if we can send one, uh, 2,000 signal elements per second, one signal element represents one bit. The top one has a data rate of 2,000 bits per second. Whereas the bottom signal, we can send two bits per signal element. That's our scheme that we designed over here. Two bits for every level or every signal element. So if we can send 2,000 signal elements per second and two bits per signal element, the second signal will give us a data rate of 4,000 bits per second. So we differentiate now between the signal rate and the data rate. Going back to what Nyquist said, Nyquist come up with a theorem that says that with, if we don't have any noise, if we have a bandwidth of B, B hertz, the maximum signal rate we can achieve is two times B. Bandwidth of 1000 hertz, maximum, maximum signal rate is two times 1000 or 2000 signal elements per second. But as we know, one signal, el signal element can carry more than one bit. That's what we've seen here. We can carry two bits per signal element. So in fact, the capacity or the data rate Here's C for capacity, but we can also think as data rate, equals 2 times the bandwidth log base 2 of M, where M is the number of levels that we have. And that matches what we see here in our example. Let's Let's give the, the, our example. Uh, in this example, if we go back, the square wave was generated with a 1000 hertz uh, frequency and bandwidth. Where's our... If we have a signal with a 1000 hertz bandwidth then the signal rate that we can achieve is two times that according to the Nyquist capacity. And I'll say 2,000 signal elements per second. That's this value. But now the data rate depends upon the number of bits per signal element. And in Nyquist, that's the value M, the number of levels. In the top one, the number of levels is two. One level, another level. That's here. Two levels, so M equals two in this case. Log in base two of two is one. The data rate if we if you look at your equation, is 2 times the bandwidth times log base 2 of m. Our signal rate is 2,000 signal elements per second. m is 2, log base 2 of 2 is 1, so it's 1 times 2,000. The data rate is 2,000 bits per second. That's what we've calculated before in the first signal. In the second signal, the one at the bottom, say m2, we have four levels. Here. How many bits per level? Well, log, the best case is log base 2 of 4 is anyone? 2. The data rate we can achieve is 2 times the signal rate, which is 4,000 bits per second. We've already got the answer here. So the Nyquist capacity equation, when we say capacity, we mean the data rate, the maximum number of bits per second, is 2 times the bandwidth, which really gives us the signal rate, times by log in base 2 of the number of levels we use for our signaling scheme.
and we see that in our example of our two signals and it applies to others as well. Assuming no noise, that's under the ideal assumptions that there are no noise in the environment. What does that mean? Okay, increase the bandwidth increases the data rate. And we've seen that in our examples beforehand. In fact, it's a direct proportion, a proportion, proportionality between the bandwidth and the data rate here. Double the bandwidth, double your data rate. Also, to increase the data rate, to make C go higher, increase M. That is, increase the number of signal levels increases the data rate. And that's what we saw here. From two levels to four levels, we got a higher data rate. We went from 2,000 bits per second up to 4,000 bits per second. The thing that the equation doesn't capture, because it assumes that there's no noise, but one thing that we know is that if you increase the number of signal levels, it makes it harder for the receiver to interpret the bits in the presence of noise. That is, the more signal levels, no, the more bit errors we'll have, if there is noise. But this equation assumes there's no noise. So this is correct if there was no noise. But we know in real life there will be noise. So it gives us an upper, lim upper limit on a communication channel of how fast we can send. If someone you go work for a company and you need to buy a communications link, okay? And someone's trying to sell you the technology. And they say that the bandwidth of this link is one megahertz. And we're using a signaling scheme with just two levels. And they say we can get a data rate of 10 megabits per second. Do you buy it? They say the bandwidth is 1 megahertz, so that's the bandwidth of the channel, and they're using a signaling scheme which just has two levels, and they're trying to sell you this new channel for 10 million baht, and they say we can achieve a data rate of 10 megabits per second. What do you do? You buy it? You don't buy it. Why not? 10 megabits per second, that's good. What's wrong? It, it, it's too high. If B is 1 million and M is 2, then it becomes 1 times 2 times 1 million. The maximum data rate in theory that you can achieve with a bandwidth of 1 megahertz is just 2 megabits per second. 2 times 1 million times log base 2 of 2, which is just 1 here, the maximum data rate you can achieve is 2 megabits per second. If they say, oh, we can send 10 megabits per second across it, you walk away because they're lying. Because this is the upper limit. You cannot go better than this. Okay? In reality, you cannot achieve this because in reality there is noise. But if there was no noise, this would be the fastest that you can send given some conditions. So it's useful as a quick way to determine, well, how fast can we send if we know the bandwidth and we know the number of levels? But it's not accurate because, in fact, there's noise in all systems. Find the answer. or think about what you need to do. To find the answer of this question. Can anyone find the answer? Mm -hmm. 
if we, so the question is how about the levels? Well, this question doesn't give us any information. So the first thing you recognize that, okay, we have, we know the bandwidth. So a telephone system, so your home fixed landline telephone transmits signals with a bandwidth of approximately 3,100 hertz. How fast can we send across the telephone network if we're sending data? Well, it depends if we look, if we want to apply Nyquist capacity, it depends upon the number of levels we transmit at. If we transmit at just two levels, m equal to two, then with a bandwidth of 3,100 hertz, the capacity or the data rate that we can achieve, remember 2b log in base 2 of m, 2 times 3,100 log base 2 of 2, which is 1, easy, 6,200 bits per second. If we transmit using a signaling scheme where we just have two levels, we can send 6,200 bits per second. So Hertz yeah. is equivalent to bits per second? No. Hertz is not equivalent to bits per second. What we're doing here is uh, it's related to the number of levels here. Um, think we're mapping from bandwidth, remember in Hertz, which is the number of, uh, well, we can think the signal elements per second, and in applying this equation, it converts it into bits per second. We're converting really the analog signal into some measure of digital data. So yes, we start with hertz and end up with bits per second, but don't think as they are being the same. Okay, that's the, the how this can cause com confusion. That don't assume that they are the same. They are not. But if you go back to last week where we did that analysis and calculated the number of bits per second, we see how that's arrived at by looking at the period of the signal, the number of bits per signal element, and so on. In both, and we'll see in the next equation, we get the same relationship between hertz and bits per second. Okay. Who has internet at home? In their dorm or somewhere? Anyone? Via ADSL. Put your hand up. Hands up if you've got ADSL. Not Wi-Fi, not mobile phone internet, but ADSL, you know, plug in the telephone line internet at home or in the dorm. Come on. Some people? Or somewhere? Okay. Who has used it? So you have an ADSL modem. Before that, you were probably old enough, maybe you can remember before them, the dial-up modems. Anyone remember them? Okay, where they make that squeaking, squawking noise when they dial up? Remember them? How fast? 56 what? 56K. So you had a modem, and here's your telephone line. And here's your computer, and 56 kilobits per second. Same telephone line. The bandwidth of that telephone line that your modem use is around 3,100 hertz. How can you achieve 56 kilobits per second? The bandwidth is just 3,100 hertz. That's the real bandwidth of our telephone line, the one that you use with your dial-up modem. How, do you, how can you achieve 56 kilobits per second? Again? Increase the number of levels. That is, if we have just two levels, we know the data rate we're going to achieve is 6.2 kilobits per second. But we know that, in fact, our modem could achieve 56 kilobits per second. How? Because it's using the same bandwidth. M is increased. That is, when you use that 56 kilobits per second modem, the value of M was higher. What was it, or what was it close to? Anyone can determine? 
what, how many lev levels did that modem use to transmit the signal? Again? Eight levels? Nine levels? Be careful. What's the value of M? M is the number of levels. How many levels did it use? What about 2 to the power of 8? And so that was one answer. What is 2 to the power of 8? If it was, let's try this one. If m was 2 to the power of 8 or 256, we have 256 levels. Not 4, not 2, but in that space we have 256 different levels. Then apply our equation, and what do we get? We get the same bandwidth, 2, the capacity equals 2 times 3100 times log base 2 of 256, which is 8. Which is what? 49.6 kilobits per second. Getting close. Not quite though. If m was 2 to the power of 9, if m was 2 to the power of 9 or 512, then it would be 9 times 6200, which would be, I think, 55.6 kilobits per second, which is close. Uh, someone said 9.03, but remember, we are mapping these levels to bits. We need to have an integer number. If, in fact, there were some overheads involved. So if m was ten, uh, 2 to the power of 10, 1,024, then c would be 2 times 3,100 times log base 2 of 1,024. Log of 1,024 is 10 times 2 times 3,100 is 62 kilobits per second, which sounds about right because, in fact, to get your 56, I think there were a few overheads involved. So I think your modem used 1,024 levels in the signal that it transmitted, and that's how you get the the 56 kilobits per second data rate. Nine would also work, or would be very close to the power of nine. OK, so here's the relationship between your telephone line, which has some bandwidth for which it can transmit signals, and the data rate that you could achieve with your modem. Sorry? Do we choose 10 years or 10 levels? 10 levels in theory would give us 62 kilobits per second. So the in practical would be about uh, To be honest, I, I don't know if it was 9 or 10. 9 would give us 55 point something. Okay. I think 10, I think it was 10. That is, it gives us 62 kilobits per second, but there are some overheads. It, we do not get exactly that because there's noise. So I think it was 10. Any questions? So we're just using the Nyquist equation here. Capacity or data rate equals 2 times the bandwidth times log base 2 of the number of levels, m. If you know the bandwidth and number of levels, you can find the capacity, or the other way around. So everyone had, has internet now. No one uses a dial-up. You have ADSL. Do you get faster? Yes, you can get multiple megabits per second. Well, in fact, what your ADSL modem does now, it may use different levels. The, in the past, the old dial-up modems used the bandwidth of 3,100 hertz, the same as the telephone line. Your ADSL modem uses a larger bandwidth. B is increased much larger with an ADSL modem. That's why we can get higher data rates. M is also high, but uh, I think the bandwidth with the ADSL modem is it uses up to one megahertz. So
So then it depends upon the number of levels whether you can get one megabit, uh, two megabits per second in ADSL up to or ADSL2 up to 24 megabits per second. The, the transmission media limits the bandwidth. Our copper wires inside these LAN cables, which is the same as your telephone line, these copper wires can carry uh, electrical signals and the bandwidth of the signals that they can carry is limited by the physical characteristics of the copper of carrying electrical signals. I think uh, nowadays they can carry up to 100 megahertz a bandwidth of about 100 megahertz. Uh, but there are different factors that involve. Some may be even slightly higher, 500 megahertz. Coaxial cable and optical, optical fiber can carry different bandwidths of signals, higher. It's like normal telephone line. Mm. Uh, the friend ADSL was introduced. Mm. They, they had a, an adapter with uh, like, set, um, multi, like multiply them. But with one, one normal telephone line, mm. it divides into both telephone and ADSL. So you still have this at home. Normally, you have a telephone. Yeah, you have some device that is a splitter. In fact, a filter that filters out the frequencies from the different transmission. But the telephone line carries signals at so at some bandwidth across many frequencies. Okay, it carries signals with different frequencies, giving us a bandwidth. We can use some of those frequencies to represent your voice when you're talking, and other frequencies to represent your data when you're sending it from your computer. And that's what ADSL does. It allows you to talk and to use the internet at the same time. Your old dial-up modem only allowed you to use one. You couldn't talk and use the internet at the same time. ADSL uses more, more bandwidth, uh, allowing both at the same time. We may see some examples of that in, an, in another topic, ADSL. So Nyquist gives us a relationship between number of levels, bandwidth, and data rate. Importantly, assuming no noise. In reality, there is noise. And we saw that this morning that when there's noise, if we increase the number of levels, more chance of errors. So Nyquist doesn't capture that. Because with the, if we just use this, let's increase the number of levels up to not 1,000, 1 million. 1 billion. Keep increasing the number of levels and we'll get a higher data rate. But in fact, if we increase the number of levels, we know that with noise, we'll get more errors. Shannon extended this work and came up with a relationship between bandwidth B and maximum data rate or capacity C which took into account the amount of noise in the system. So assuming now there is noise, which is true, we may get errors. Okay? And that effectively reduces our data rate. And we've mentioned yesterday that from the receiver's perspective, they need to receive a strong signal and the noise needs to be low. For you to receive my information at a fast rate, I need to talk loud enough and there needs to be very little noise in this system. The more noise in this room, the harder it is for you to receive the information I'm communicating. And with a communication system, if we increase the strength at which I'm sending my signal, the easier it is to you, for you to receive it. So we get some relationship between the signal strength or the signal power at the receiver and the noise power at the receiver and we get this relationship called the signal-to-noise ratio, SNR. 
and Shannon showed that the relationship between capacity and bandwidth depends upon the signal to noise ratio. Let's give a simple example first. We have space. Let's say we have a channel with a bandwidth of 10 megahertz. And I transmit a signal. So here's my A transmits to B. We can transmit at a signals with a bandwidth of 10 megahertz across this link. We transmit with some signal strength at the source. We know that the signal gets weaker, it gets weaker across distance. Let's say the signal is received with some strength S. And let's give it a value. Uh, let's make up a number that's easy to calculate. Five hundred and twelve, and let's give it a strength in terms of milliwatts. Okay, we can often measure signal strength or power in terms of watts or milliwatts. B receives some signal with strength five hundred and twelve milliwatts, but there's also some noise in the system because there's other transmitters. There's thermal noise. B receives that noise, N, and that noise has a value of 2 milliwatts. Okay? The signal received is much stronger than the noise, but there's a little bit of noise in the system. So how we use this to calculate the capacity, in this scenario, signal 512, noise 2, we can say, well, we can calculate the signal to noise ratio, which is just the signal strength divided by the noise strength. 512 divided by 2. Note it's milliwatts divided by milliwatts, so there are no units at the end. It's unitless. It's just a ratio. Answer? 256. Our signal to noise ratio is 256 in this case. Our signal received is 256 times stronger than the noise received. Using the Shannon capacity, we see that the capacity, or the maximum data rate now, is the bandwidth, this is 10 megahertz, 10 million, 10 by 10 to the 6, 10 mega, log base 2, I used the wrong number, I forgot about the 1, 1 plus the signal to noise ratio, 1 plus 256, which is 257, log base 2 of 257 is approximately 8. 8, 2 to the power of 8 is 256. So log of 256 is 8. Log of 257 is about 8. I should have used a different number. So this is approximately 8. Times by 10 million equals, and I'll just write it here, sorry, 80 megabits per second. Log base 2 of 257 is approximately 8. 8 times 10 million is 80 million bits per second. So here's our conversion from hertz into bits per second. They relate these factors together. That's how we use the Shannon capacity. If we know the bandwidth of our channel and we know the strength of the signal received relative to the strength of the noise received, we can calculate the capacity, the maximum data rate we can send through that channel. We'll come back and look at SNR shortly, but uh, so from this equation we can see the trade-offs. Yep. No, this is taking into account not the levels of our signalling, but taking into account the noise and the signal strength. But then levels also has an effect. Yeah, so they are both 
uh, they consider different uh, circumstances. So in th they are theorems. They are not perfect in practice, but they closely match what we think is uh, the capacity. And in fact, Shannon is considered the more accurate because it takes into account signal and noise power. Remember, the number of levels is related to yeah, well, the noise impacts upon the number of levels. Well, that is, the more levels, the more, the more chance of errors, and eventually the lower the data rate. So that's how we relate them. Just from the equation, we see again, increase B, the bandwidth, increases our data rate. Same as Nyquist. Increasing bandwidth increases data rate. Increase the signal power. Increase this up to 1,024. If the signal power goes up, the signal to noise ratio goes up, and the data rate will go up. Okay? So increase the power which we can receive the signal. Or reduce the noise. That is, if we can make the noise smaller, if N goes down, SNR goes up, data rate goes up. Other way, if noise goes up, everything else is fixed. If the noise power goes up, SNR will go down. And therefore, the data rate will go down. Increasing the noise reduces the data rate. One thing that's not shown in this equation, but is uh, when we mentioned noise before, generally when we increase the bandwidth, more chance of noise uh, allows more noise. So that's not given in the equation, but it's a practical relationship here. And in fact, also increasing the signal power increases some aspects of noise. We can interfere with others. If I turn up the volume, that makes the signal power stronger and the data rate higher. But if, if I turn up the volume too high, I may start with to interfere with other people communicating in the next room and so on, and downstairs. And we can think that that causes problems as well. So we need to, in practice, maintain a reasonable signal power and a reasonable bandwidth. So we cannot make them infinitely high. We cannot just increase the signal power as strong as we want because it has other impacts, although not captured in the equation. Do we have one more example? The next example is relating signal strength and noise strength. Here is an absolute relationship. That is, one value divided by another. In practice, we'll often use decibels to represent the ratio between one power level and another power level. What's the equation for a decibel, to calculate a decibel in power levels? Anyone remember? When did you study decibels? High school. Did you study in any of the courses this last year or this the year before? Decibels. Remember decibels? There's your homework for the next week. It's got some summary in the handouts on one of the earlier, on the definitions handout, which talks about decibels. I'm not going to go through it now. Uh, there's an equation you'll see, in fact it's on the screen. Decibels are a way to uh, specify a ratio between two power levels. Signal to noise ratio is one power relative to another power. We can express that in decibels by taking the absolute value, the ratio, log in base 10 multiplied by 10 and we get db. SNR in absolute is 256 in db equals in our example 10 log in base 10 of 
256, whatever that is. So we can express ratios between powers in an absolute way or using decibels. And we will commonly use decibels. So your homework is to check and read about decibels. And if the current quiz doesn't have example questions, I'll create a new quiz which has some example questions about dB as well. So, I, in fact, I think the next quiz, quiz 6, is really about the capacity equations, Shannon and Nyquist capacity. So there's three questions, and those questions have not just absolute ratios, but include dB, decibel. So you need to understand what a decibel is or how to calculate dB to answer the questions about capacity. So that's easy for you to read in your own time. We're going to stop there. Any questions? So what we've gone through, and we've finished this topic on data transmission, we've gone through how s signals are created, they're based on sinusoids. We can combine them in different ways to create real communication signals. We looked at frequency, bandwidth, data rate, noise, errors. And we finished with two equations that relate some of those factors together. The Nyquist capacity equation, which relates the Nyquist capacity equation, which relates bandwidth and the number of levels in our signaling scheme with data rate, assuming no noise. And then Shannon improved upon that taking into account noise, so relating the signal strength at the receiver, the noise at the receiver, and the bandwidth to get some capacity or maximum data rate. Often the signal to noise ratio is expressed in dB, like in this question. Therefore you need to know how to convert from dB to an absolute value, because the signal to noise ratio in Shannon's equation is an absolute value. SNR is an absolute value, not in dB. So you'll do quiz 6 for the homework, which includes just questions on Nyquist and Shannon. And to do them, you need to know about decibels. So you'll read up on the handouts and do some practice questions on dB.